Ladies and gentlemen, I am Uncle Kage. I really don't know why, <clears throat> but uh, I've been getting up on stage and enjoying alcoholic beverages in moderation, for the most part, for very nearly 25 years now. <clears throat> and pretty much all I do is get up here and, and drink and talk. So if you're expecting anything else, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <clears throat> They call this Uncle Kage Story Hour, so that's what you're going to get. I am joined up here on stage by the incomparable Fox Amore. Hey, guys. And by one of the most amazingly powerful, broad-shouldered, muscular fellows in all of American Sign Language uh, business, this is Bick Lee, ladies and gentlemen. He'll be joined by his compatriot shortly. She's gone to the bar to make sure I have an extra bottle. <laughs> hey, what? Oh, um... Hey, Audie, I'm gonna turn this off and on real quick. This fixes all electronic objects. It might. <clears throat> Come three, two, one. Pew! It's going to take a few moments here. It's kind of advanced. I'll, I'll keep him busy. It's got a whole loading screen. It's got to go. For. Oh, let me see. Oh, it's in German. Laden. 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 Yay! <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hey, Fox and War, ladies and gentlemen. It actually fixed it. <laughs> um, incidentally, uh, those of you who don't know, uh, this has been a somewhat tumultuous year for me in terms of uh, my, my employment. I'm a scientist. I don't just wear this for fun. Uh, this is what I wear to work. Well, not this exact one, <clears throat> but um, I am a chemist. I work in the Research Triangle area of North Carolina. I'm in the pharmaceutical industry. I have a doctorate in chemistry from Dartmouth, 1991. Boy, a lot of people went to Dartmouth, didn't they? <clears throat> Just before I left, I, I have taken new employment at a wonderful company I just started in February. And um, I'm, I'm still settling in. On Monday, I was uh, standing in the door of my office. One of the departmental directors has a, a, an office two doors down from me, and he was wandering about too. And I happened to mention to somebody, I'm going to Pittsburgh. And the departmental director said, oh, really, I'm going to Pittsburgh, too. I said, oh, that's nice. When are you going to be there? He said, Thursday through Sunday. I said, really? What did, uh, pray tell, what is it you plan to do in Pittsburgh? He said, oh, visiting family. Dan, <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? But prior to landing this wonderful job, I, I had a, a difficult situation. Um, I had found employment at a contract laboratory in the city of Wilmington, North Carolina, which is located two hours south from my home in Raleigh. That made for an interesting commute. <clears throat> so I, I actually had to get a little cheap and sleazy apartment down there for a couple of nights a week spend one or two days up in the, the, the office in, in Raleigh. It was not an ideal circumstance, particularly because the company is, uh, I guess, not progressive is the best word for it. Fascist, I guess, is another word for it. <clears throat> oh, oh, ooh, you don't like that? Let me tell you a story. We had this little, uh, this little party called Hurricane Florence. It came through last year, and it was uh, not very long after I had actually been given an offer by the company to, I, I was working as a contractor, you see, and they wanted me now to come on full time. And I was reluctant. <clears throat> um, a very, very nice fellow, a, a great guy named Vernon, he was in charge of, uh, of the department they wanted me for, and he was lobbying very, very, very hard to get me to join. He was, I mean, he was almost pleading on bended knee. And I was considering it when Hurricane Florence came through. The hurricane 
was making landfall on Thursday morning. On Tuesday, a site-wide email came out to all staff in Wilmington. The governor has requested the city of Wilmington be evacuated. We are shutting the site down at noon on Tuesday for your safety. All work is to cease, all equipment is to be turned off, everything is to be powered down, and you are to get out of town. You have the option of using leave without pay or vacation time. Is there a rating for this show? Oh, I'm the chairman. Fuck these guys, that's what I say, okay. So this made poor Vernon's job very difficult because I resisted all his advances. They offered me the moon and the stars. They offered me a wonderful salary. But here's the thing, what good is a big butt ton of money if you're miserable? But I didn't have any other options. So very reluctantly, I accepted the job in Wilmington and that giant, huge two-hour commute in the cheap and sleazy apartment and all that. Four weeks later, an old friend of mine up in Raleigh, very close to my home, called up and said, are you still looking for a job? And I said, well, now that you mention it, where the hell were you a month ago, asshole? He said, well, I got something for you. I said, okay, yeah, but I just took a job down in Wilmington a month ago. You're asking me to be that guy? The guy that comes, joins the company, and then a month later bails? And he said, well, yeah. I said, look, you have known me for the better part of 10 years, and you honestly think that that is something I would do as a professional. He said, well, maybe not as a professional, but you actually are very much a dick. <laughs> he had me, I, I couldn't. I... <clears throat> but what am I gonna tell Vernon? I, he had worked so hard, he had, he had you know, pl practically bled to get me to accept that job. And now I'm gonna go to the poor man and tell him, I'm bailing out on you? <laughs> that was very difficult for me. I need, some, I need some proper sad music. I was practicing in front of a mirror at home. Uh, hey, Vernon, can I? No. Um, say, Vernon, I, I really need, oh, no, no, no. Um, Hey, Vernon, uh, oh God, no. <clears throat> it was the Monday after Thanksgiving, <clears throat> and I was, I was facing the decision date for the, the job up, up north. And I, I was sitting in the morning meeting with my head in my hands thinking, okay, I, I'm gonna have to find out a way to tell him and just deal with his reaction. Is he gonna cry? Is he gonna be mad? I'm just gonna have to do it. And Vernon came in and said, I just quit, I'm leaving the end of the week. <laughs> so that became the official story. Oh man, I came here to work for Vernon. Well, oh, and now that he's leaving, I... Don't tell anybody. <clears throat> Don't put this on YouTube. <clears throat> Although, okay, the company maybe was not as bad as, as, I, as I say. But have you ever heard of the thing called Glassdoor.com? It's fun to look at the reviews this company had on Glassdoor.com. At the time, I was ready to join the company. They had 67 reviews, 63 of which were one star. The rest of which were five star and probably came from the HR department. My two favorite reviews, the, the featured review that you very first go to, was very short. All it said was, don't, really, just don't. And I read down a little further and one of them said, have you ever been to North Korea? <laughs> hmm. 
So I told the company up north, yeah, I'll, I'll come and I'll join you. But it's going to have to wait till February because I am not going to just bail on this company without giving them the opportunity to replace me. Because how can you replace me? Right? <clears throat> and I told the company, I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you till February. This is the end of November. I'm going to give you guys till February. I will do everything in my power to get you somebody to replace me. The company advertised the position at 2 o'clock in the afternoon of my last day. What was I said before? Oh, yeah. Fuck those guys. By the way, I do apologize. If anybody here has uh, children in the audience, out. If anybody here has children in the audience and they're laughing, not my fault. Okay? I'm looking at you, Boozy. <clears throat> That particular November was particularly eventful because not only was all this happening, but I, I finally returned to my nice little condo up, uh, up north in Raleigh, North Carolina, as opposed to the deep south of Wilmington. <coughs> uh, it was starting to get a little bit cold, and it was right about that time, uh, as I was still preparing to you know, leave Wilmington, one particular day, I noticed it was getting a little bit chilly in the place. And I also noticed that the hot water was not hot. When you're a homeowner, these sorts of things happen, and they really piss you off. Because if you rent, you can call up a landlord, hey, 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 hey. When you own the place, that's yours. <clears throat> the heat and the hot water operate on the same system. It's hot water fueled heat. Now, it's starting to get very, very bitterly cold in North Carolina. The temperature was dropping down to about 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Enough to chill the blood. <clears throat> Thank you, Fox. <clears throat> and I, uh, I, I called a, a repair person. Actually, what I did was I, I called the company that had been taking care of my air conditioning and heating system. And I said, can you fix this? And they said, oh no, the, the problem is in the hot water heater. You need to hire a plumber. Okay, why not? So I brought in a plumber. Yeah, a little guy with a mustache, just like that. And I opened the door, I said, it's me, your plumber. And he came in. <clears throat> And he said, oh, I see the problem. Uh, this is a gas hot water heater. Your gas control valve has gone bad. It'll have to be replaced. And I saw the dollar signs flash in my eyes, but if you have to, you have to. So I told him, all right, how long is this going to take? And he said, well, I might be able to get one today. If I can't, I'll see if I can get one from the supplier tomorrow. Okay, that's another night with no hot water. I'll just, I'll just go down to my little dear and sainted mom's place, you know, and shower there. She just lives down the road. The next day, which was a Thursday, the plumbing company called back and said, okay, uh, we're going to get a gas control valve for you Thursday. I said, yes, but this is Thursday. They said, oh, no, no, no not this one. I said, which one? They said, one of them. I said, let me get this straight. I have a gas control valve coming, and you don't know where it is. They said, oh, we know exactly where it is. And I said, where? And they said, coming. So I waited a week. On the appointed day, I called them and said, is my gas control valve here? And they said, no. I gave them another day, and they also said no. So I called the uh, air conditioning and heating company, and I said, look, I know this is a plumbing issue, but I need a gas control valve. Can you guys give me some advice? And they said, have you considered calling the manufacturer of the hot water heater? And I said, of course, yes, naturally. Yeah, that's, that's the first thing I thought of. 
I was just about to do that when I got off the phone with you. Bye. And I called the manufacturer and I said, you guys got a gas control valve for this you know, thing? And the lady said, oh yeah, how many do you need? One, that really, I, I'm not greedy, just one will do. She said, when do you need it? I said, now. She said, oh, oh, the, 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 the pickup for UPS is at 3.30, it's 3.28 now. Let's see if we can get the order in in two minutes. We almost did. At 3.31, she hit send. But you know how systems are. So I didn't have my gas control valve. This is gonna leave me with another weekend. Monday, the gas control valve is going to show up. Monday, however, we had an incident. A weather incident in North Carolina. It snowed somewhere in the state. <laughs> and everything ground to a screeching halt. Because for those of you in snowy areas, you take it for granted you have snow removal equipment. In such states as North Carolina, they don't. Their strategy for dealing with snowfall is to wait for it to melt. <laughs> Honestly, that's why the schools will close for a week. You can look up on, on the intertubes there, on your googly searches, look for Raleigh Snowpocalypse 2014. It's a very famous photo of a street in Raleigh covered with snow and cars everywhere, one of them upside down and on fire. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I used to live in Arkansas, by the way, years ago. They had the same problem. In the entire state, they had one sand truck, which they used at the capital area. I saw it one day in action. The sand truck was a dump truck with four convicts in the back with shovel. So Monday came about and I was waiting for the delivery and I was watching the UPS thing. You know, the UPS tracker, you know, is the thing that's in the, you know, it hasn't gone yet. No, it hasn't gone yet. No, it hasn't gone yet. And then suddenly it said, delivery attempted. I said, no, no, I've been waiting here. There's no footprints in the dusting of snow out there. So I called up UPS and said, what the hell is this? They said, we attempted delivery. I said, no, you did not. They said, well, we thought about it. I said, so what's this mean for me? And the lady said, well, we really couldn't endanger one of our drivers to go out and bring you your package. I said, oh, yes, I mean, those, those snowflakes could have crashed through the windshield of his truck and impaled him, I guess. <laughs> so I had to wait till the next day, and it arrived. But then I started to think, do I really want to have a plumbing company that couldn't figure out how to get one of these things, install it? I called the heating and air conditioning people again and I said, okay, listen, this is a gas control valve. I know that you service gas units. This is not part of the water system, it's part of the natural gas system. Can you install this valve for me? And the lady said, well, we're, we're really not supposed to. It, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's like this. If we did not install the unit, we can't install the gas control valve. You're going to have to get somebody else to do it. And I said, oh. Well, you know, I'm sitting here looking at it. It doesn't look that difficult. Yeah, I, I, I'm, okay, I can see it right now. I'm, I can probably just hacksaw off at each end. And you get some duct tape. They say, no, 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 sir, sir, this really has to be done by a professional. I said, no, to hell with it. I, no, I got a hacksaw, I got duct tape, I'll be fine. The lady said, sir, could you hold on a moment? And she put me on hold, and 30 seconds later, she came on and said, we'll have somebody out there tomorrow. <laughs> there.
There are times you simply have to play hardball with people. I, I am a firm believer in customer service. Th this is, after all, the service industry. We want to make people happy. We want to give people what they want. Which is why when I see a customer service issue at another corporation, I try to bring it to their attention. You know, professional courtesy. So I tried to be very professionally courteous to Air Canada a few months ago. Oh, you've flown Air Canada, have you? I was flying up to uh, Fernal Equinox in Toronto. There's the Canadians out there. <clears throat> hmm. Pardon me. I'm gonna have to go faster. There's four bottles back there. Share? Share? <laughs> Screw you, no. <laughs> the only person I would share it with is Bick, and it would be awkward with him trying to hold the glass. That's what happens with sign language people when they hold a glass of alcohol. They start to slur their words. <laughs> Sorry, Bick, I love you. I just thought of that just on the cuff. I th anyway. <laughs> I was flying, I had a wonderful time at Fernal Equinox. Fernal Equinox is great and they have Tim Hortons. Oh my God, I love Tim Hortons. You could just give me intravenous Tim Hortons coffee and I will love you forever. They, it, it, it's made with, with freshly roasted coffee beans and heroin. <clears throat> and sugar. <clears throat> when I was flying back, uh, I, I went to the Air Canada Maple Leaf Lounge, because that's what us frequent flyers do. You, you go to the lounge, right? and they, they give you alcohol, and you're like, oh, I'm in the lounge, and <laughs> And I was sitting and, and made some friends with some German gentlemen, <clears throat> and we were talking. I didn't try to speak German to them. These guys know what happens when, that, when I try to do that. That's the Eurofurns guys down here. I'll tell you more about them later if you're good. <clears throat> I was sitting in the Air Canada Maple Leaf Lounge at Toronto's Pearson Airport, and an announcement came over. I hear all sorts of announcements. This was a new one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we seem to be experiencing a small fire in the gate area. Please do not go to the gate area. And I looked at the German gentleman, and I said, yes, important safety tip, I think we should stay here. So uh, we, we, uh, we refreshed ourselves, and we were sitting chatting. And I said to these guys, wait a minute, whoa, wait, wait, wait. If there's a fire in the gate area, that might affect our outbound flight somewhat, as fires tend to do when they burn things, like airplanes. I said, I'm gonna go find out. So I, I went, around down a little hallway to where the front desk, the reception area of the, the lounge was. And I saw all of the staff gathered. And I saw the manager saying, okay, we're going to open the stairway here. You're going to go get everybody out. We need to make sure nobody's back in that area. That's all I had to hear. I went back and I said to my German friends, okay, guys, pack your bags. I think we're leaving. So the announcement came, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we do apologize for the inconvenience. Oh, Canadians love to apologize. We're very sorry, they said, but uh, we're afraid we're going to have to evacuate the club. So if you would kindly get your belongings and come to the reception area, we will lead you to safety. So we're starting to pack up and we all looked over at the bar where nobody was standing with all these bottles and we looked at each other and we thought, I wonder how close that fire is. <laughs> but by that point, we noticed we could smell smoke. We'll come back, wait for us. <laughs> so they got all of the patrons assembled and by now I could see visible smoke and I was starting to think, you know, this might turn into one of those stories. So the, the club 
staff were phenomenal. Kept everybody calm, kept everybody informed, made sure there was no panic or excitement. They lined us up just like a, a, a school, you know, evacuation drill. And they led us down the stairs, down a winding set of stairs, past a bunch of alarms that were going off, out a door into the open. And we walked along the edge of the tarmac to another door and we went in it was a reception area, and right there was a Tim Hortons. I said, I'm in heaven. That's it. Hallelujah. Okay. So I sent a text to my mom in case she would uh, be upset. I wanted to calm her down. I sent a text to my mom saying, hi, airport on fire, emergency vehicles everywhere, but Tim Hortons. Bye. Love you. That was to get her back from the time she was taking a train from North Carolina to visit me to go back home to Pennsylvania. And she sent me a text saying, well, the train didn't derail, but the truck's in very bad condition. You had it coming. <clears throat> so we were waiting there, and some buses came along. And we were ushered onto the buses, and they drove us a great distance to some place that I think was in Manitoba. None of the Americans know Canadian geography. That's why there was no reaction to that. <clears throat> oh my God. There's a little fly on the rim of my glass. It's a kindred spirit. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Dude, fuck off, I'm telling you, go on. There we go. Oh, it's on me. It, it likes me. It must be a fruit fly. <laughs> it was the best I could think of on short notice. <clears throat> so the buses eventually took us to a pair of glass doors, and they opened, and the people got off of the bus. It was a customs receiving area. And we stood there and we kind of all looked at each other and said, okay, what now? And there was a, a lady there in a Mountie uniform who was saying, okay, move along, please move along, move along. And I said, yes, may I ask, move along where? And she said, well, well where do you want to go? I said, well, home, frankly. She said, you have to go through customs. I said, well, I've already gone through Cuffston's Miss. She said, what are you doing here? I said, okay, we were evacuated from Terminal 1 because of the fire. She said, what fire? I said, I'm not going to get a lot of information out of you, I don't think. Apparently, Terminal 1 is uh, actively on fire. Uh, you might notice the, the red lights and the orange glow on the horizon. Yeah, that, that's not a Maple Leafs game. That's, that's Terminal 1. See, okay. <clears throat> she said, I don't know anything about that. You're just going to have to go back through customs. Okay, why not? I, I'm starting to, to ping Air Canada on Twitter saying, help guys, give us some guidance. What are we supposed to do? There was no answer. So I went back through, through, the, through the border back into Canada. <clears throat> back through customs. And uh, the, the customs agent said, um, hello, uh, how long do you plan to be in Canada? I said, well, a minute if I have my druthers. They don't have a good sense of humor, these border people. And I said, well, we were evacuated here from the fire in Terminal 1. Yes, there is a fire in Terminal 1, I know. And he said, well, I don't know anything about that. I said, obviously, what am I supposed to do? He took my passport, he went, welcome to Canada. So we were ushered back into Canada. Apparently this side of the door is the United States, this side is Canada, it's weird up there. <clears throat> so we found ourselves in a luggage claim area. And we began to ask ourselves, are we supposed to now collect our luggage? What are we supposed to do? And Air Canada was not answering. And I tried calling Air Canada's ticketing number. 
they had other things on their mind. Air Canada was like, yeah, we, we had to cancel a bunch of flights because of the 7.30 max. Sorry, buddy. That's all they said over and over. We had to cancel the flights due to the 7.37 max. Sorry, buddy. I'm serious. That's what they said. <clears throat> sorry. I'm sorry, buddy. I mean, it's, it's usually very charming, but when you're tired and your clothes smell like smoke and you just want to get back home, it's not that funny. And we were getting very agitated. No one could tell us what to do. Oh my gosh, Bick turned into Lauren. Hi, Lauren. <clears throat> it's amazing this transformation that goes on over here. I never see it happen. So when it happens, tell me, I want to see it. We found an information desk, which is a misnomer. Up against a wall was a little box about this big with a man sitting on a stool and a little tiny sign in 18 point font said information went up and I said I wonder if you can help me and he said well I'll try I said well that's further than I've gotten from anybody else thank you very much for that um, we have just been evacuated from terminal one because of the fire and he looked at me and I said you're going to say what fire aren't you he said, I've not been informed of any fire. I said, you see the Maple Leafs game going on out there? <laughs> That's not a Maple Leafs game. That's Terminal 1. <clears throat> Can you tell us what we're supposed to do? So bless his soul, he got on the phone and started calling to multiple people who also had not realized this was not a Maple Leafs game going on. And finally he hung up and he said, well, sir, I was not able to get any information. The, the best advice I can give you is this. Um, go down to the end of, the, uh, of the, the chamber here. Make a right, there's a corridor. When you get to the end of the corridor, there's double doors. Turn left, go down to the fourth set of doors, take the escalators up, get onto the tram, and go to Terminal 1. Excuse me, um, you, you, you might have missed the, the, the whole point of me being here. I'm happy to take your advice, but what if, hypothetically, I get on the tram and I go to Terminal 1 and Terminal 1 happens to still be on fire? He said, well then come back. It's at this point I need to remind you I don't make this shit up. My stories are true. <clears throat> and you can ask my friends and family in the front row, they'll tell you, oh yeah, it happens just like this. As a matter of fact, we were having dinner earlier, Big Blue Fox was there, and he was explaining to my mother that nothing ever happened in his life until he met me. And then every single week, some calamity befell somebody as long as I was there. We'd be driving down the Autobahn and cars would explode on either sides of us. That's not true, I made that up. That's the one thing I made up. <clears throat> so, still true, thank you. So I, I, I befriended a, a gentleman, he was on his way to New York City, a fellow named Bruce. And we started, you know, power walking through the terminal, grumbling to each other, wondering what we're going to do. And we, we passed the requisite number of spots, but we saw no escalator, nothing to indicate anything was going to Terminal 1. So we said, well, hell, we've come this far, let's just keep walking. We will either find Terminal 1 or we will be back in the United States because I believe we're heading south. <clears throat> so, at one point I happened to glance over my shoulder. We're power walking along, about 30 feet behind us was a gang of 50 or 60 people all struggling to keep up. <clears throat> and I looked over at Bruce and I said, I think they're following us. And then I realized, when I travel, particularly in the winter, I like to wear my bowler. And apparently I had this beacon on my head everybody was just zeroing in on. <clears throat> we finally found the escalators up to the tram, <clears throat> took us to Terminal 1. It was fun getting on because once we got on the little, little, little tram there and the doors closed, 
we realized just how much our clothes smelled like smoke. Because it's like on there, it's like, then the other people were saying, does anybody else smell fire? And Bruce and I said, yeah, it's us. We're burning. <clears throat> I even said to some people, are you, are you on your way to Terminal 1? And they said, yes. I said, yeah, that's what you think. <clears throat> but when we got there, the fire had apparently been extinguished. So now, everyone who had been in Terminal 1 on both sides of the border had now returned to the concourse. I would estimate maybe 2,000 people, maybe about the size of this room, if you will, all trying to get across the border again, but the border had not reopened. And nobody was telling us anything. We started to queue up. The Canadians say queue up. You guys say that too, right? Yeah, he's, 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 he's Scottish. <clears throat> and we were standing there and the announcements kept coming on. All planes are being held at their gates. Well, that sounded promising. But as time went on, we started to think, what exactly does being held at their gates mean? Way out here, the, the, the border crossing is here, and way out on the concourse, there was a flight board that told us the status of all the departing flights. And they all simply said, delayed. Very useful information there. <clears throat> Periodically, we would kind of draw straws, this big crowd of people, and elect a person to run back to the concourse and see if there was any more information because Air Canada was not very forthcoming. <clears throat> and the person would run back and say, it hasn't changed. And of course, the airport Wi-Fi was somewhat full, if you can imagine. First off, it's Canada. It's a third world country. They don't have the best Wi-Fi. <clears throat> I'm sorry, buddy. So, after a time, one man suddenly announced, oh my God, I got through to the Air Canada website. He became the Messiah. <laughs> People were clustering around him. Tell us, tell us, oh master, how may we achieve home? And this guy's going, okay, what's your flight? Uh, that one's canceled. Sorry, buddy. How about you? What's your flight? Sorry, buddy. I said, I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to Raleigh. He went, okay, Raleigh. Sorry about, bye. I ran out. By now, Air Canada had decided it might be a good idea to open a one or two ticketing counters. So I got on the phone to United Airlines through whom I had booked this ill-fated ticket. And I said, I'm a United Airlines amazing high-level suck-my-dick frequent flyer and I need your help. I'm standing in line, I'm going to be talking to an Air Canada representative, but if you can help me, I would much rather you did because you at least speak English without an accent. And then he said, well, thank you very much, Dr. Conway. I'm going to try to find you a new... And just about when I was two people away from the, the ticket agent, the nice lady came back on. I'm terribly sorry, Dr. Conway, because you are with Air Canada, our assistance do not match. I am unable to offer you any assistance. I'm very sorry, buddy. <laughs> she didn't say that, I threw that in. <clears throat> I got up to the ticket agent lady, <clears throat> and um, about that time, the, the nice lady on the phone said, oh, wait, I, I can't rebook you. And I'm like, don't go away. Don't, don't go away. Stay there. You can rebook me? She said, yes, there is a flight at 8.15 tomorrow. I'm going to put you on it. I said, great. What about my luggage? She said, you'll have to talk to the Air Canada lady. I said, she's right here. No problem. Thank you. Love you. Bye-bye. 
I said, hi, Air Canada lady. Um, I've just been rebooked on the 815 flight tomorrow to Raleigh, and I need to find out about my luggage. And lady went, tappity, tappity, tappy. I don't see an 815 flight. I said, but, but, but she, she just, she, she told me it's an 815 flight. And she said, I don't see an 815 flight. I said, but she just, okay, it was flight, let me try to remember, it was flight seven, 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 it was seven, seven, six, one, nine? No. I was getting frantic. She told me there's a flight at eight, but maybe it's seven, six, nine, one. She went, oh, there it is. Oh, it must have been hard to see among the 85 flights from Toronto to Raleigh tomorrow morning. <clears throat> Somebody's flown from Toronto to Raleigh, I can tell. <clears throat> so she gave me a boarding pass, and I said, now, where do I get my luggage? She said, you don't. I said, but it's my luggage. I would very much like to have it. She said, it hasn't been released yet. I said, what are my options? She said, well, you can wait here and see if it gets released. And that's when I said, thank you. I'm calling Ronnie. Maybe he'll let me crash on his floor. <clears throat> so I left the airport. Ronnie let me crash on his floor. Ronnie's Canadian, by the way, if you can figure that out. Oh, that's great music. I love that. <clears throat> the next morning, three hours before the departing flight, I went back to the airport with my boarding pass, and I went to the Air Canada counter, and I said, Hi. I have a boarding pass. Before I make any assumptions, I want to make sure that, number one, my luggage is going to be on this plane, and number two, this plane actually exists. <laughs> so the lady was going tappity, 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 and getting that frown on her face, that one that says, I'm looking at the matrix, I don't understand it. <clears throat> And she was getting squintier and squintier looking at the screen. And finally, I could stand the suspense no longer. I said, what is the problem, miss? She said, well, I've never seen this before. You have a ticket and you have a seat assignment, but you don't have a reservation. I'm gonna let that one sink in for a moment because your reaction right now is exactly what I was thinking. If I have a ticket and I have a seat assignment, isn't that what a reservation is? She said, yes, that's why it's so confusing. I said, well, I'm glad that we're all very confused. Could you find out how to fix this? So she went toddling off. <clears throat> it took about 15 minutes. She finally came back out of breath with a new boarding pass. She said, we got it sorted. Terribly sorry. Here is your new boarding pass. We've got the reservation sorted. I said, and the luggage? She said, your bag is on the plane. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. The border was now open. <clears throat> I went to the border crossing. Odd sort of circumstance. There's a guy there saying, did you check any luggage? If the answer is yes, you went over here. Did you check any luggage? The answer is no, you proceeded across the border. The man, when he asked me, had I checked any luggage? I said, yes, it's on the plane, see? He went tappity tapping on his computer. He said, oh, your bag hasn't been released yet. I said, no, no, you're a little late. That was last night. Of course it's been released. He said, well, according to this, it's not been released. I said, okay, I'll bite. What do I have to do? Because at this point I had gone, I was past being mad and now I was just amused because I just wanted to see what was going to happen next. This is great. It's like a choose your own adventure book. If you turn left, you get the dragon. If you don't. I said, what do I need to do? He said, okay, go down to the end of the concourse. Uh, you're going to turn right. When you get to a set of double doors, go through the double doors, turn left. You're going to go down four things. You can see an escalator. I said, wait, it's not going to take me to Terminal 1, is it? He said, no, no, there's a service desk there. I said, bye. And I went down, down the corridor, the end of the, to the right, and through the doors, and down, and an escalator, and up. There was a counter. 
with about six or seven computer stations and six or seven Air Canada representatives and a long queue of people snaking away from it. I still had two and a half hours to kill, so I got in the queue. And they were doing their best to take care of people. There was one guy, I still, to this day, don't know what this was. The guy was standing at a computer screen and he wasn't moving. I said to the lady behind me, I think he's dead. He didn't move the entire time. Excuse me. Oh, the trauma. I finally got to the front of this dreadful queue and I said, the man outside told me my bag had not been released. And the lady said, Oh, well, you didn't have to stand in the queue. I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm loving this. I'm just loving every minute of this. This is great. I'm going to be talking about this on stage in a couple months, by the way. <clears throat> so, okay, lay it on me. What do I got to do now? She said, oh, well, take a seat. And there's a board over there, and you'll see names popping up. When your name pops up, your bag has been released. Okay, so I sat and I was watching the board. That's why they call it a board, by the way. <laughs> My name will pop up eventually. And I was getting a little bit worried because I noticed names would come up and they'd be up for 10 or 15 minutes and then they would disappear. And another name would come up and there'd be six or seven and then one of them would disappear. And I thought, what if mine already popped up and it disappeared. How would I know? Rod Serling was whispering in my ear, sorry, buddy. <laughs> so I was thinking to get up, and I happened to look over my shoulder. There was a very, very frail, elderly black lady. Please forgive me the term black. <clears throat> and she was in a wheelchair. And as I sat, she, she very painfully got up out of the wheelchair and was starting to shuffle very slowly toward the men's room. Now, I'm from North Carolina. We're still wrestling with this. And I'm like, uh, um, um, <clears throat> what do you do? Uh, it's the 21st century. Maybe the, oh, gosh. Well, I saw her go in and then a moment later she came shuffling out again and she was wandering around looking lost okay I am my father's son we are not going to have any of this while on my watch okay so I got up and I, I said uh, madam do you need some help and she looked at me and I realized very quickly she did not speak English she spoke only French fortunately I speak French of course she didn't have to because she looked at me and she said Je voudrais faire du pipi. Ici, madame, ici, ah, là, là, ici, ici, ici. So I led her over to the ladies' room, and then I went and I got her wheelchair for her, and I waited for her. And when she came out, I sat her down in the wheelchair, and that's when she tugged my sleeve and she told me in French that uh, she was from one of the Caribbean islands, you see. Charming. Oh, I lost it. She explained she didn't have a boarding pass. She'd been there since I got there. And I went up to the counter and I flagged somebody down. They were trying to tell me to wait in the queue. I said, uh-uh, is anyone helping this lady? And they seemed to notice her for the first time. And an Air Canada representative came out and went to talk to her. I found the one person in Canada who doesn't speak French. So I had to translate.
Where was I? Oh yes, French. <clears throat> when this was all done, they gave the nice lady her boarding pass and somebody came to take her to her plane. And I went back and I looked at the board and I thought, oh wait. Now it's very likely my name came up and had gone away. So I went and I found a, a, another Air Canada person. I said, how do I know if my name didn't come up and go away again? The lady said, oh, let me see your boarding pass. She went to a little kiosk and went, boop. She says, oh, no, no, it's released. Give me! I went running back to the border. You know, trailing my luggage behind me, holding onto my bowler with this hand. And it went up, same guy at the, at the border. I said, hi, okay, it's taken care of. Can I go now? And he put the boarding pass under. And he said, oh, um, your bag's not released. It's deleted. I said, what does deleted mean? He said, it means it's not here anymore. I said, well, where did it go? This is, this is not Houdini, what's going on here? Is there a spatial anomaly here in Pearson Airport? The AV guys hate me, by the way. So he said, you're going to have to go back down the end of the, and I said, yeah, I know the way. So I ran back, and this time I didn't bother waiting in the queue. I took a tip from my dear and sated mother, old man, old man, excuse me, old man. Slam the thing down and said, what the hell's going on in my bag? And the lady took it and she, she put it in and she said, it says it's been deleted. I said, uh-huh. She said, what does that mean? I ain't making this up. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. <clears throat> she started going to the other counters. Now, perhaps I've been hanging around Bic for a while because I can read lips. I saw her going up and saying, <clears throat> Finally, she called in a supervisor. <clears throat> the supervisor came in and he said, how may I help you? And it's, my bag is deleted. So he called the first lady over and said, this gentleman's bag is deleted. I said, she knows, I told her, okay? So she went on the computer, tappity tappy. Okay, what do I do now? And I saw him say, okay, click undelete. <laughs> I swear, yeah, undelete. Poop, there, you're done. Ran through the border, got on my plane with 15 seconds to spare. Got back to Raleigh, wrote a scathing letter to Air Canada. First off, praising the staff at the Air Canada Lounge for their handling of the emergency, but absolutely damning Air Canada customer service for abandoning us in a foreign third world country where nobody knows how to goddamn undelete a bag. I listed bullet point, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this is why you suck. It was three months before I got a reply. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I got a bunch of other things on my list here, but I'm just about out of time. You've got a lot more talent coming up on this stage. I'm the opening act. The real show is still to come. Before I go, I've got a little note. Because a lot of people have been coming up to me this weekend saying, Oh, Uncle Kage, we want to start furry conventions. <laughs> no, no you don't, no. 
If you want to start a furry convention, first off, make friends with a lawyer. Give him booze. They work for booze. They don't give him booze. <clears throat> One of the first things in the United States, if you want to organize a furry convention and you want to be non-profit, you must register yourselves as a non-profit entity with the United States government. You do that through section 501C of the tax code. A lot of people don't understand a subtle nuance. We have on one hand 501c3, a pure public charity, a school, a church, a blood donation group, something that benefits the public at large. Versus 501c7, that is a fraternal organization, a social group, a community group. When I incorporated Anthrocon on the 30th of June, 1998, that was fucking 21 years ago, wasn't it? <clears throat> Thank you. I was doing my research. <clears throat> 501c3, pure public charity. Is this thing going to be a, a pure public charity or is it a fraternal organization? Well, I, I happen to have taken some notes here. <clears throat> this is what the requirement is for a 501c7. <clears throat> the club, club, must be organized for exempt purposes. You know, you can't be organized for profit. The club must be supported by membership fees. The club must provide an opportunity for personal contact among members. That's the one. <clears throat> I'm a very, very timely person. I have 31 more seconds. <clears throat> but I'm going to relinquish the... the boy, I'm done. I'm going to relinquish that 18 more seconds and I'm going to invite the most amazing rabbit you have ever met. Chris the Comedy Bunny, where are you? You better be ready because everything starts on time at Anthrocon. Yeah, Euroference, suck it. Okay. I'm going to invite Chris the Comedy Bunny up here to introduce the rest of the... I'm going to... So, Chris the Comedy Bunny is on his way up the ramp right now. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a big hand for Chris the Comedy Bunny.